Hello friends and welcome back to the fifth and final edition of Snake Nanigans and Stories. Um, it's crazy hat day here. I am wearing my tiny gigantic hat and, um, and my bat dress, as you can kind of see. Um, so I hope that you're having a spoopy week leading up to Halloween and I'd be very curious to hear about what everybody's doing with their Halloween this year. So. JP and I are going to do the same thing that we do every year, which is hang out and uh, watch scary movies and eat garbage. So that that would have been our plan anyway. So I'm I'm happy um, for that, and I'm also happy for our very spoopy weather here in Chicago. It's been cloudy. It's been atmospheric. We've even had a little snow. Um, I won't complain about that. So I hope everybody is doing well. And welcome, if you're just joining me now, um, to the fifth and final edition of Snake Nanigans and Stories. So I'm going to get right into it because I have a special lineup tonight of Halloween themed everything. Hello, Brenda. Um, thank you for the video. Um, all right, so let's talk about tonight's lineup. Oh boy, oh boy. So we're going to read one more story from Short and Shivery by Robert D. Sansucci, illustrated by... Have I memorized her name yet? Catherine Coville. I did not. We're going to read one more story from the Scary Stories series. Alvin Schwartz, illustrated by Stephen Gamble. Then we're going to read from a book that we have not read from at all yet or during Spooky Story Tuesdays this spring, and that's going to be Our Haunted Lives by Jeff Belanger. And that's going to be a really cool story about the Farnsworth House in Gettysburg, which is one of my favorite haunted places that I have also stayed at before. All right. And then I have two special Halloween poems that I'm going to read. One is going to be by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and it's going to be pretty profound and intense and very um, atmospheric. And then we will end with um, with Five Little Pumpkins, which I think is one of everybody's favorite um, Halloween poems for, for kids and for adults alike. So, I shall also share my current reading. I have to hurry up and finish Aragon, which I'm still reading and have been reading for an eternity. Um, and I have a huge growing pile of books now that I'm going to be working on through, probably through, the fall and winter. Um, that's Aragon by Christopher Paulini. I just I forgot to say his name. Um, huge pile of books that I'll be working on through the winter coming in for the Society of Midland Authors Midland Author Award. So I'm judging in the children's fiction category and I have more books uh, that have been added to my stack of books. Um, I'll just show them to you and goats need closure. So some really fun titles. So All He Knew by Helen Frost, Even Goats Need Closure by Jane Donovan and Holly Trechter, Please Don't Say an X Word by W. Nicola Lisa, and Libby Lytton and the End of the Winding Path by C.R. Kama, and so, uh, and there's more on the way, and I just got a few today that I have not yet unpacked, so I'm really going to have my hands full, and I'm really excited to devour these fun books. So, of course, I have a very special guest tonight. That special guest is going to be Pepper, our Hog Island boa, who is waiting in, you know, waiting in the trenches for, for me to, um, to grab a hold of him, I guess. Um, but before I do that and get my hands full, hi Ron, hi Ronald, how are you? Let's do spooky talk before I, you know, get too deep down in it. So, as you all know, spooky talk. <laughs> oh, Allison, I'll get to that part. She says, show us your snakes. That's what everybody wants to see, right? Um, so let's do the spooky talk part first so that I don't get 30 minutes into it and then remember spooky talk. So I'm going to pick one card at random and then everybody is on the hook for an incredibly creative and thoughtful response. Or not. You can talk amongst yourselves and play along however you like. So I'm going to pick this one. Ooh, 
Ooh, this is interesting. All right. The other spooky talk cards have been kind of on point with our theme here, but this one is a little bit different. This one is about levitation. Levitation is a type of psychokinesis practiced by psychic mediums, shamans, and wizards. Using only the power of the mind, people and objects are lifted up and suspended in the air. Some people under demonic possession are also levitated. So the spooky talk question is, what other things happen to people who are possessed? And don't say they wear silly hats. All right. I am ready for Pepper. Jonathan's special cameo. He's not in a dragon costume tonight. Hi, buddy. Pepper. So this is our gorgeous boy. Hi, buddy. Oh, yes. Who likes Jonathan way more than he likes me because I'm a nervous Nelly. Hi, <laughs> spoopy head. Look at this guy. This is Pepper. He is our gorgeous, gorgeous Hog Island boa. And I took a bunch of notes on him, like I always do with everybody. He's just looking for a place to climb here. Oh, you can't see his head was sticking straight up. So he's our little, our little special needs guy. Um, I think I mentioned that during Spooky Story Tuesdays this spring that he may be the product of some, uh, some inbreeding, and his eyes are set a l apart a little bit differently from each other, and. He, um, he's a little bit moodier than the average bear, um, or at least he used to be, but he's not really anymore. Like, he's really chilled out a lot. And he still makes me a little bit nervous sometimes. I think it's important to be honest about that, even though we've had him for, like, what, two years now? We've had him for two years, and he's almost three years old, and you can see he's still very small. Um, that He's unusually small for, for a hog island boa, even though they do... Uh, do not get very large um, and but he's a he's a gentle he's a gentle creature and uh, I feel like when he's nervous with me it's because I make him nervous because he can feel that I'm a little bit tense sometimes when I handle him uh, and actually it's interesting looking at him right now one of his pupils is dilated and the other one is not so I don't know if that is normal for snakes or if it's just our boy one of his eyes is, of course, looking towards the light, and the other one is not. So, I don't know. I just wonder. But he's fine. He's totally cool. But he's our only little Sneckum, and he's the smallest one. I mean, Moonlight's pretty small. Uh, and uh, he still makes me a little nervous sometimes. So, Hog Island Boas are super special boas. And if you have any questions, please do let me know throughout. Um, and let me try to do an up close there with his beautiful face. Come, look at the, look at the camera. Oh, and my armpits again. The true horror of Halloween is me trying to block my armpits from the view of the camera. There we go. Um, their scientific name, which I screwed up the last time, is Boa Constrictor Imperator. They do not have a special scientific name that is different from common boas. They are not considered their own special subspecies. They're just considered to be a morph of common boas. Hog Island boas are so named because they come from the Hog Islands of Honduras, which is a small chain of like 37 islands. Um, or no, it's a small chain of islands 37 square miles off the coast of Honduras. And they were isolated from the regular boa population, and so they grew to um, appear differently and have different types of behaviors than other boas that live on the mainland in Central America and in Honduras. So the wild population is extremely low because they were collected almost to extinction in the 1980s. Um, his great-grandparents probably would have been some of the original inhabitants of the island that were probably collected sometime in the 80s. And this particular snake was bought from Vince Russo, who is um, like a big name in the boa world, in the, bro in the boa breeding world. And the population was brought back from the brink of extinction by people who have been captive breeding them. So they're pretty common now in the pet trade, um, but they're just starting to reintroduce them, or they're just, I think, getting back on their feet in the wild populations. Um, 
The females tend to get five or six feet long and the males tend to get about four or five feet long. So he is a boy to our knowledge. Look at how beautiful he is and speckled. His head is of course facing away from the camera. Um, and he, I would say is about, he might be two or three feet long, but he's pretty small. Um, and so we feed him regularly. It may be that this is just how he's gonna grow, just very slowly, um, or we, we may see a growth spurt yet. So um, they have what is referred to as insular dwarfism, which um, is what I was referring to earlier, talking about how they're isolated away from the other snake populations on the islands there, where they have no natural predators and they don't need to grow as big. Um, and they don't need to be as scary and they're often or they were often seen um, kind of lounging out in the open and not being very secretive snackums and they're also uh, also naturally hypomelanistic so whoops i keep gotta lift him up even higher so you can see that um, if you know about like natural looking boas they have those beautiful gray and black and red patterns and the saddles um, are absolutely gorgeous. And these guys have a bit more of a um, muted or washed out kind of tan tone to them, which is quite gorgeous. And then his tail, oh, there he is. Hello, spoopy face. Oh, he's coming right at you. All right, cool. Um, his tail has a lot of pink on it, like this gorgeous salmon pink. And the saddles back here are beautiful red color. So you can see that, but they are muted from what the natural coloring of the common bow would be. And he's got these like speckles all over him, these like black little sprinkles, which is how he got the name Pepper, um, which are also common characteristics of hog island boas. They do live to be about 20 or 30 years in captivity. Same with a lot of the other um, domestic captive snakes. <coughs> Um, I wanted to talk about their teeth because we didn't really talk about snake teeth too much during our snake nanigans series. And their teeth are hook-like, so they don't have fangs, and that goes for all of the snakes that we've met so far. And let's recap real quick. We've had Dewey, the Colombian red-tailed Suriname boa mix. We have had Miles, the corn snake. Although, well, first we had Moonlight, the spotted python, then we had Miles, the corn snake, then we had Sunshine, the ball python, and now we've got Dewey, the hog island boa. So they have lots and lots of teeth that fill their whole mouths, and they have these kind of like hook-like structures on them so that when they capture their prey, the teeth kind of sink in and they kind of, um, the prey cannot pull back out. So kind of like a porcupine quill in a way. Um, and many snakes uh, who are constrictors have these same kind of teeth so not all snakes have big scary fangs um, he would live in the rainforest as his natural habitat um, there are a lot of rainforests out there in there he is he's coming back around um, in honduras and in these islands off of honduras and so here in chicago illinois in east lakeview he lives in a 20 gallon tank and um, we have tried uh, to our, the best of our ability to recreate his rainforest surroundings but we you know we have hides for him we have naturalistic looking plants for him and uh, we try to keep it a little more humid for him than for our other snakes who can withstand a little bit lower humidity he likes a bit higher humidity but he's also somebody who's not a huge fan of the um, the super warm you know warm end of his tank so he'll go for um it's usually 75 to 85 degrees on or i would say 70 to 85 on the cooler side of his tank and then he has a basking spot of 90 to 95 degrees um, and then at night for all of our bebas um, things get to be down around like 65 degrees and they all seem to like that just fine I also learned, and I'm not sure if this is true of all snakes, but all of our snakes are big drinkers, like our personal brood of little dragons um, love to uh, drink, like they will take these big long gulps out of their water dishes that are very cute um, to watch, except for him. I've never seen him drink from his actual water bowl and he has the neatest 
cleanest water bowl in the entire world. And I was reading about them that they get most of their water from the air and that most often if they decide to use their water bowl for anything, and this is also true with other snakes, they will use it um, to soak. So as with our other Bebas, we have um, a big enough water bowl for him to be able to soak his entire body in if he wants to. And, um, and yeah, but I've never seen him do that either. I've seen Miles, our corn snake, soaking, and I've seen uh, Sunshine and Dewey um, both soaking. I've never seen Moonlight or, or Pepper um, soaking themselves in their water bowls. Um, but I've seen everybody else take a big drink except for this guy as well. In the wild, um, they would primarily eat birds. That would be a big staple of their diet. Um, but here in Chicago, again in East Lakeview, this poor little guy is stuck with what he can get, which in this case is frozen thawed adult mice, which he receives once every 10 days or so with the rest of our critters who are also fed on like a 10 to 14 day cycle, depending on how big the prey is. All right, I mentioned that they have no natural predators and I mentioned that he was bought, so he is adopted. We adopted him through the adoptions program at the Chicago Herpetological Society, as with our other Bebas. Um, he came with a sibling, so he has a sister. And I think, so we had him sexed, but he was a little bit too young, so we think that he's the boy and that she's the girl and it kind of makes sense because he's still a little small and I think she's grown a bit. Um, but in any case, uh, he had a sister with him and those siblings were bought together from like, um, like a reptile expo and, uh, we ended up being able to adopt him and I really wanted to have a little boa and then we brought him home and he was nippy and it made me scared. <laughs> so, um, it was kind of funny, um. He would just sort of like lash out at the air, um, not even with his mouth open, but he would hiss and puff and had all sorts of interesting, strange behaviors that I wasn't used to seeing. I had seen Miles hissing and puffing before, but he was not quite as intimidating, whereas this guy would like strike out while he was still in my hand. Um, and that was a little disconcerting, but never striking toward us. He accidentally bit Jonathan once during a feeding which was our fault because um, he just missed, he just missed the mouse and accidentally got Jonathan's um, hand and apparently it really wasn't that bad. My fear if I ever was to be bitten by a, one of our snakes is not that it would hurt, it's that I would have even more fear around handling them or being with them and that it would damage my relationship with them and I would never want something like that to happen and I would never want them to be traumatized by something like that. If you do have a pet snake and they do bite you, the most important thing is not to panic and it's not to like rip your hand away. Uh, they will learn uh, that if they bite or if they act like they're gonna bite, that it does intimidate you and you will put them down. So if you need to handle them for any reason and you want to maintain like a, a good relationship with them, you have to show them that you're not afraid. So that kind of stinks, but it's par for the course. So, so far so good with this guy. He's chilled out a lot. It's not uncommon at all for little tiny baby boas to be super temperamental and nervous. Um, and then they chill out as they get older, which is absolutely true of this guy. He has just been such a love. And, uh, yeah, we just adore him and he's another one that is a, he's always a crowd favorite. Everybody thinks he's so beautiful. He's got those skeptical eyes. He's like judging, he's judging me right now. You can see it in his face. Um, he still has that, he's that cute, kind of like a, the echoes of a cute little mustache, like how Dewey had that perfect triangular black mustache. And then of course he's got this gorgeous tail and he's just a lot of fun. And we love him. So does anybody have any questions about pepper or hog island boas or snakes in general before we start the scary stories and wrap up our edition of the, the snake nanigans portion, I should say.
I will ask our spooky talk question again while folks are thinking about it. Besides levitation, this question just gets straight to the heart of it. Besides levitation, what other things happen to people who are possessed? Pepper, do you have any thoughts on that? I don't know if he does. All right. Well, I'm ready to get to the scary storytelling if you are. I think I can hold on to him for another minute or two. Mm -hmm. I'll let you know. <laughs> he finally seems to have settled into a place where he's comfortable. He seems like he finally found his little nook here on my hand that he can live with. So I don't want to ruin it. All right. So first story of the night. It's called The Halloween Pony, and it's from a French folk tale. Grandmother put another log on the fire. Outside the little house, which was not far from the sea, the wind was howling so fiercely that it set the windows rattling. Listen to that, said the old woman. There's a storm brewing for sure. She stirred the coals in the fireplace with a heavy poker until the new log caught and began to blaze. Satisfied, she turned to her three grandsons, who were sitting on the floor gazing thoughtfully into the flames. Besides, she added, this is Halloween, which is our abroad tonight, and the goblins, who are their servants, are wandering about in all sorts of disguises, looking for children to snatch away. But Tom, the eldest boy, said, I won't stay here, frightened of a little wind and old stories. I promised Colette I'd call on her tonight. She swore she wouldn't get a wink of sleep if I didn't visit her before the moon had gone down. I have to go and catch lobsters and crabs, said the middle boy, Lewis. Not all the witches and goblins in the world will keep me from that. All three brothers announced they were going out for one reason or another and ignored the warnings of their grandmother. Only the youngest child hesitated a minute when she said to him, You stay with me, my little Richard, and I'll tell you stories of fairylands and magic animals. But he wanted to pick blackberries by the moonlight, so he ran out after his brothers. He caught up with them on the rise, beneath the old oak tree. Grandmother talks about wind and storm, but I've never seen the weather finer or the sky clearer, said Lewis. I'll bring home plenty of crabs and lobsters tonight. See how big the moon is, said Tom. Perhaps I can coax Colette to go for a walk with me. Then Richard, who was starting for the blackberry patch, suddenly cried, Look! and he pointed to a little black pony standing quietly at the foot of the hill. Oh ho, said Lewis, that's old Frederick's pony. It must have escaped from its stable and is going down for a drink at the horse pond. Now, now, my pretty little pony, said Tom, going up and patting the creature with his hand. You mustn't run away. I'll lead you to the pond myself. With these words, he jumped on the pony's back. Take me too, called Lewis, and his brother helped him up. Don't leave me behind, cried Richard, and his brothers helped him mount. Soon all three were astride the little black pony, which waited patiently till they had settled themselves. Tom clung to the pony's neck. Lewis held Tom's waist, and Richard held Lewis's shirt. Now get up, urged Tom, and the little pony headed directly for the horse pond. I think Pepper likes the story. On their way, each brother met a friend and invited him to mount the pony. Soon there were six boys holding on to one another and laughing. The pony didn't seem to mind the extra weight, but pranced merrily along under the brilliant moon. The faster it trotted, the more the boys enjoyed the fun. They dug their heels into the pony's sides and called out, Gallop, little horse, you've got six of the bravest riders in the world on your back. Soon they were racing along through the grassy fields near the seashore. The wind rose, sending clouds scudding across the face of the moon and whipping the pony's long black mane across the eyes of the boys in front. Very close now, they could hear the waves pounding against the rocky shore. The pony did not mind the noise at all. Instead of going to the horse pond, he circled around and cantered rapidly toward the seashore. Louis, the middle brother, began to regret his wish to catch crabs and lobsters, and Richard, the youngest, found that he was no longer interested in blackberries. Both held on to their seats on the pony, which was galloping at breakneck speed down toward the beach. The eldest boy, Tom, seized the madly charging pony by the mane and tried to make it turn around. But he tugged and pulled in vain, for the pony galloped fast as the howling wind straight on toward the sea, pausing only when the first waves splashed over its hooves. 
The six riders thought to slip off the pony's back while it lingered at the water's edge, but they found they were stuck fast to the creature's back. Then, rearing up once, the little black pony neighed loudly, ran back and forth through the sea foam gleefully, and suddenly charged into the billowing waves while its riders cried out in terror. That's the illustration. Bear with me. The pony is bewitched, wailed Tom. We should have listened to grandmother's warning. The pony advanced farther and farther into the sea. The waves rose higher and higher until they covered the children's heads and the pony vanished beneath the swells. Some say the children were drowned. Some say the goblin pony carried them to a strange city of coral and pearl at the bottom of the sea. But they were never seen on dry land again. And that was the Halloween pony from a French folk tale from the book Short and Shivery, 30 Chilling Tales, retold by Robert D. Sansucci and illustrated by Teresa, Catherine Coville. My heavens, Catherine Coville. Beautiful. He's so beautiful. Anybody have any questions? There's Pepper, chilling out, listening to spooky stories. Any questions about snakes or Pepper or Hog Island Boas, put them in the comments. And if you'd like to answer tonight's weird spooky talk question about levitation, what other things happen to people who are possessed besides levitating, then by all means, please um, feel free to respond. So I know of one, which is that people speak in ancient or foreign languages that they wouldn't have any knowledge of otherwise. Oh boy. So, next story is going to be from Scary Stories 3, More Tales to Chill Your Bones, from Alvin Schwartz and illustrated brilliantly by Stephen Gamble. And I'm trying to do this with one hand. There we go. I think I've shared just about all, you know, all of the stories in these books um, throughout our time together in, you know, in the springtime and now. And I did find one more that has um, another one of the illustrations that really, really gave me nightmares as a kid that I still um, think about sometimes. And that story is called, Is Something Wrong? A car broke down late at night way out in the country. The driver remembered passing an empty house a few minutes earlier. I'll stay there, he thought. At least I'll get some sleep. He found some wood in the corner of the living room and made a fire in the fireplace. He covered himself with his coat and slept. Toward morning the fire went out and the cold awakened him. It'll be light soon, he thought. Then I'll go for help. He closed his eyes again, but before he could doze off there was a terrible crash. Something big and heavy had fallen out of the chimney. It lay on the floor for a minute. Then it stood up and stared down at him. The man took one look and started running. He had never seen anything so horrible in his life. He paused just long enough to jump through a window. Then he ran and ran and ran and ran until he thought his lungs would burst. As he stood in the road panting, trying to catch his breath, he felt something tap him on the shoulder. He turned and found himself staring into two big, bloody eyes in a grinning skull. It was that horrible thing. Pardon me, it said. Is something wrong? And here's the illustration. If I can get the angle right. There we go. This is like us and 2020, right? There's the illustration. All right. So I also just realized that, whew, Allison answered the question about um, what people do when they are possessed, and she answered with vomiting. So we have levitating, vomiting, 
speaking in tongues. JP, do you know what people do when they're possessed? Um, I think that's all been covered. I, surely there are more exciting things that people do when they're possessed. Let's when think. You're like, what happens when your finger, when your joints... Uh, Oh yeah, like go. people who are like uh, can like disjoint their, disjoint their okay things like bones uh, moving out of joint. Um, that's exciting. Um, does anybody else have any questions about or for Pepper? I will relinquish him now so that I can read the next couple of stories without disturbing him. Thank you to my special handler, Jonathan, snake handler, and measy handler. I know he doesn't want to go now. He's all comfortable and happy. My hand's probably, well, my hand is sweating, so I know he was warm. So snakes also enjoy being held by us. Not, I mean, actually, that's probably not the right word. They will tolerate being held by us because we are warm to them. So if they do find like a nice little place to cuddle on you and you feel just like a tree to them, you're basically, you're like a warm like a warm electric blanket for them. So um, I think he found his little niche there and was enjoying that. So that was Pepper, everybody, the Hog Island Boa. Feel free to keep asking more questions about him. And I also have pictures of all of my snakes here on Facebook. And um, when we're done with this series and uh, sometime after Halloween, after the season is over, I will upload all of these videos to YouTube as well, and then we'll see what the what the future brings for me and my my live storytelling sessions. All right, so I'm really jazzed about this. We're going to read a story from Our Haunted Lives: True Life Ghost Encounters by Jeff Belanger. Found this on the shelf and thought, why haven't I read a story from here? So I have a special one to share from the section in the book uh, about haunted hotels and inns. This hat will be the death of me. There we go. Uh, and it comes to us from J.C. Burkett, who had a special experience at the Farnsworth House Inn in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And this happened on July 25th to 27th, 2003. J.C. Burkett and her mother are both Civil War reenactors, and at least once a year they make the trip from their western Pennsylvania home to Gettysburg. For me, it's just the most interesting time period, said 17-year-old J.C. I feel a real connection to the Civil War. I've had so many ghost experiences at Gettysburg. It's my favorite place to be. In Gettysburg, a place where ghost lore lurks around every tree and in almost every building, one location seems to have more than its share of ghosts. The Farnsworth House Inn. In July of 2003, Burkett and her mom made their reservations at the Farnsworth to check out the ghosts for themselves. They had more than a few supernatural experiences while staying there. And Jeff asks, interview, this is an interview style book. What did you think of the inn when you arrived? We arrived around noon. We checked in at the bookstore, which is where you're supposed to check in, and the woman took us to our room, the Schultz room. It was such a beautiful room. She put the key in the lock, and when she tried to turn it, it would turn back all by itself. She kept trying to do that several times, and each time the lock did that. She said, oh, it looks like you... Womp womp. That is possession, folks. Paranormal activity. Just kidding. What is paranormal is my... bad hair. My witch's hat hair. There we go. Oh no. Okay. Feeling cute. Might delete later. I don't know. Okay. All right. She put the key in the lock, and when she tried to turn it, it would turn back all by itself. She kept trying to do that several times, and each time the lock did that. She said, oh, it looks like you have a visitor. And she said not to worry. They just like to play tricks. At that point, I kept telling myself, I'm not going to be afraid. Ghosts don't exist. And then when that happened with the lock, I started to get a little bit scared. She opens up the door, and there's nothing there. No breeze, no change in temperature or anything. She gave us the key and said, go ahead and have a look around if you want. So we put our stuff in the room and we decided to explore the house. We were on the second story and we walked upstairs to the attic, which was called the Garrett Room. 
It had once been a room that people could sleep in, but it had so much activity that they had actually locked it. And the only time they unlock it is whenever they give ghost tours. So my mother and I walked up the stairs and there was a heavy padlock on the door. And as soon as we reached the door, the lock started shaking and then all of a sudden it stopped and some invisible force, it felt like a wind, just blew down the stairs and it brushed past my mom and brushed past me. We tried to look through the cracks of the door to see if there was a fan or something in there and there was a fan, but it was turned off. So I was freaked out. Question from Jeff. How was your mom holding up at that point? She thought it was amazing. My mom's tough. So we explored the house for a little bit longer, and when we went back to our room, I opened the door, walked forward, and the bed was completely messed up. The sheets looked like somebody had been sleeping on them, and there was an indentation in the pillows. I was so shocked I couldn't even speak. I just gasped, and my mom said, What is it? What is it? We had just walked into the room. We were sure no one else would have access to it, and we noticed the bed. So we made up the bed and we decided to try it again. We went outside our room, closed the door, waited there for maybe five minutes or so, and walked back in, and it happened again. It was like somebody had been sleeping in the bed. Jeff asks, while you were standing right outside the door? We were right outside the door, and we didn't hear any footsteps, any sounds. We just walked back inside, and the bed was messed up again. Later on, we went to bed, maybe around 11 o'clock. And around 5 o'clock in the morning, we heard the lock on the door being messed with. Our first thought was that somebody's trying to get into the room. So we sat up and just looked at the door. The door unlocked. It was a deadbolt, and it unlocked, and the door opened up slowly, all by itself. We looked out into the hall, but there was nobody there. No shadows or anything. And then the door closed again, and it locked all by itself. My mom and I were like, this is amazing. And Jeff asks, that was the main door to your room? The main door and the only door. Earlier that night, my mom had moved several cat statues. They were the ugliest statues. She moved them off of these two antique chairs and she said, if there are any spirits here, you're welcome to sit down and you're welcome to stay. I just laughed. I thought she sounded ridiculous, but that night you could hear creaking like somebody was squirming, sitting down in them and trying to get comfortable. But I couldn't see anybody and neither could my mother. I said, oh my gosh, it worked. We were only allowed to stay in the Schultz room for one night because there was a cancellation. So the next day we had to move our stuff into the Eisenhower room in the newer part of the inn. The next evening around 8 p.m. or so we went to the Farnsworth house basement for ghost stories. It was a nice half hour show and they tell you ghost stories, some legends, and some history about the house. Supposedly, there are 14 spirits in that house, but not all from the Civil War era. After the show, we went up and we told the woman who was telling the stories about what happened that night before, before with the door opening and the chair, and she said, Oh, yes, so you're the people who were staying in that room. And we were a little bit confused. We said, Yeah, why? She said, That was the soldier sitting down, and he wanted me to tell you that he was thanking you for letting him stay and rest. We were like, Oh my gosh, because we never told her that we said, you can stay and rest here, please sit down, or whatever, and she knew about it. And then she said, whenever the door opened, that was the soldier letting you know that he had rested, and that was him leaving the room. Later that night, we went back to the Eisenhower room, and I showered around 11 p.m., then my mom went and got her shower. I was just sitting on the bed writing, and all of a sudden, there's pressure beside me on the bed. I looked over and there was another indentation on the bed like somebody was sitting down. Well, I screamed, ran into the bathroom, and said, Mom, Mom, someone just sat on the bed. My mom came running out, and when we came back out, there was a little two or three inch white feather laying on the bed. I don't know where it came from. I figured maybe it was from the pillow or something. I didn't have anything that had feathers on it. I still have that feather. And Jeff says, Burkett was told by employees at the inn that the pillows don't have feathers in them because of Pennsylvania hotel requirements. We went back to the room, and we went to bed a little bit later that night. During the night, I kicked off all the covers because it got so hot. I said, Mom, I'm just so hot, I can't sleep. My mom said, Oh, that feels nice. I said, What feels nice? She said, You're playing with my hair. I said, I'm not playing with your hair. 
She was half in and half out of sleep, and she said, Ah, oh, well, it still feels nice. I was clutching the mattress because I was so scared. I tried to drift back off to sleep, and then the covers were pulled back on over me. I take them off again, and I said, Stop it, but my mom didn't reply. I just tried to fall asleep, and again the covers were pulled over me, and someone pinched my arm. I kicked them off, and I got kind of snippy with my mom. I said, Mom, stop covering me. I'm too hot. She said, I didn't cover you up. I'm trying to sleep here. I was terrified. And the pinches felt like someone was trying to make the point, like, stop, this is for your own good. We went back to sleep, and I decided to keep the covers on and hold them, hold on to them for dear life. Several hours later, my mom wakes me up. She's pushing me, and she goes, Mary, Mary, JC, there's Mary. Mary was one of the spirits who was a midwife at the house. I said, where is she? I don't see her. My mom is pointing frantically, going, right there. She's right there. How can you not see her? And I said, well, I just, I can't see her. I don't know. I was looking, and my mom was pointing around the room like Mary was moving. And then my mom pointed to the wall like she just went through the wall. I said, is she still there? And my mom said, no. She just went through the wall, but I could see her face. She had wrinkles, and her hair was braided. I could see the collar of her dress, but I couldn't see anything past her torso. I figured maybe Mary realized me being a kid that I would be scared, and she could only appear to certain people, and she didn't want to scare me. I thought that weekend was so amazing, and ever since, we've been going back to the Farnsworth every year. And Jeff asks, have you had any experiences since? Oh yes, definitely. There's been reports of two spirit children in the inn. On another trip to the Farnsworth, my mom and I were very tired and we went to bed maybe around 10 o'clock. Several minutes later, we started hearing kids running up and down the stairs and back and forth in the hall. We said, you know, if they don't stop within the next five minutes, we're going to get up and ask them to please be quiet or go to bed, tell their parents or something. So the running went on and on and on. They'd run down the hall, run back to where our door was, and then the sound stopped outside our door. And you'd hear giggles, and then they started running down the stairs. Then the running would start from a different place. And they wouldn't be coming from downstairs. They'd be coming from upstairs and running back to our room and then back downstairs. We had had enough. My mom went and she waited by the door, ready to open it up the next time the kids came over. Whenever they ran past, you did see shadows. You could see the shadows at the bottom of the door. So my mom waited until she could hear them coming again. And when they were coming down the hall, she opened up the door, but there was no one there. No shadows, nothing. It was freaky. And the note from Jeff is, JC and her mom have gone back to the Farnsworth each year. They have since brought recording equipment and cameras, turning their stay into a bit of a ghost hunt as well. So that was the Farnsworth House Inn in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania from Our Haunted Lives, True Life Ghost Encounters by Jeff Belanger. Let's check in with spooky talk. Levitation is tonight's theme. Um, I suppose possession is really tonight's theme. And uh, what things happen to people who are possessed aside from levitating. So we've established that uh, people who are possessed will also vomit. They will speak in foreign or ancient languages that they would not have known otherwise. Um, they will be able to, uh, their, dis, what, would be, what would the term be, disjoint their, their bones, something along those lines. They'll have unnatural movements. Who's it, Jenny Fleck? Genuflecting. Oh, that's a good one. JP mentioned uh, genuflecting repeatedly. So that is when you drop to your knees as if in prayer. Um, but the repeated genuflecting that will happen so quickly, it would be physically impossible for like a regular person to do. And uh, I don't know. I'm turning it over to you folks out there uh, to help me answer that. And if you have any other questions about Hog Island bows or pepper or snakes in general, feel free to ask. I have two more special things to share with you. One is a poem uh, to carry us through uh, the rest of Halloween and spoopy season before uh, heaven knows what awaits us in, in November and beyond. And this poem is called Haunted Houses. 
All houses wherein men have lived and died are haunted houses. Through the open doors, the harmless phantoms on their errands glide with feet that make no sound upon the floors. We meet them at the doorway, on the stair, along the passages they come and go, impalpable impressions on the air, a sense of something moving to and fro. There are more guests at table than the hosts, invited the illuminated hall, is thronged with quiet inoffensive ghosts as silent as the pictures on the wall. The stranger at my fireside cannot see the forms I see nor hear the sounds I hear. He but perceives what is while unto me all that has been is visible and clear. We have no title deeds to house or lands. Owners and occupants of earlier dates from graves forgotten stretch their dusty hands and hold in mortmen till their old estates. The spirit world around this world of sense floats like an atmosphere and everywhere wafts through these earthly mists and vapors dense a vital breath of more ethereal air. Our little lives are kept in equipoise by opposite attractions and desires, the struggle of the instinct that enjoys and the more noble instinct that aspires. These perturbations, this perpetual jar of earthly wants and aspirations high, come from the influence of an unseen star, an undiscovered planet in our sky. And as the moon from some dark cate of cloud throws o'er the sea a floating bridge of light across whose trembling planks our fancies crowd into the realm of mystery and night. So from the world of spirits there descends a bridge of light connecting it with this, o'er whose unsteady floor that sways and bends wander our thoughts above the dark abyss. That is Haunted Houses, by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And they just don't write them like that anymore. Amazing. All right, and my last little poem that I would like to share with everybody is a little bit more uh, lighthearted than that. And so if you're home and you know this one, you can uh, chant along with me if you want to, but it's going to be called um, five little pumpkins and I'm sure we've you know we've all heard this at one time or another and I um, this one does not list the author JP do you mind looking up the author of five little pumpkins sure thank you all right ready five little pumpkins sitting on a gate the first one said oh my it's getting late the second one said, there are witches in the air. The third one said, I don't care. The fourth one said, let's run and run and run. The fifth one said, it's Halloween fun. Then ooh went the wind and out went the lights and the five little pumpkins rolled out of sight. So I'm gonna read that one more time. Did you find the author? It's a song. Is it a song? It's a, yeah, it's, it's a poem. Um, and then it's been covered by some bands. Oh my, I have a ton of comments too, and I simply did not uh, scroll down. Excellent. Let me catch up with these. Brenda says, spitting out pea soup, indeed, and head spinning, also uh, products of possession. Ron mentions speaking other languages. Afterbur asks, isn't Pepper the one that bit Jonathan when he was feeding him? Yes, thank you for remembering. That was an unfortunate uh, occurrence in which Pepper flew through the air like a magical being uh, after he missed the mouse and missed, you know, went straight past the tongs. So we feed them with tongs. We don't like dangle the mouse or anything. Went past the tongs, got Jonathan on the hand. Jonathan pulled his hand back in surprise, launching Pepper across the room while I was uh, having my banjo lesson on Zoom. So I had to pause everything. Nobody, it all happened behind the camera, but I'm sure everybody in my class saw me go like this. 
and then I had to pause and pretend like something normal was happening uh, and then not try to have to explain to people um, how weird our lives are. Um, Ron also mentions changes in face and body features is another sign. Ooh, and Allison comes in with the good stuff. The four official signs uh, of possession, according to the Catholic Church, um, I think I remember them too. The one is um, definitely the speaking in foreign languages, um, physical strength that they would not have had before, um, intolerance, this is, Brenda's got it, intolerance to spiritual items like uh, holy water or crosses or Bibles or if these are, this is of course has to do with mostly Catholicism and Christian lore. There are other rules in other religions and probably uh, ones that are as old as Christianity. Um, do, 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 do. It's public domain, I can't find an author. That's weird. Okay, sorry. Maybe there is no author to be found for our mysterious little uh, pumpkin. Okay. Aversion to religious objects, unnatural strength, knowledge of unknowable things, speaking or understanding foreign languages you've never learned. So the knowledge of unknowable things would be like knowing somebody's life secrets that, uh, that they could not have told you. And Allison, I got these exciting spooky talk cards in Galena at the... Um, Haunted Galena Ghost Tours storefront, which I also forget the name of. What was their storefront called? It's a really cool name. This is why Jonathan is just my my savior here with coming in with the uh, coming in clutch with the answers that I don't have. Um, Brenda, how often do we clean their tanks? We clean them uh, every time they poop, which tends to be. Uh, once a week, so sometimes less often. So in the winter, they're probably only going to poop like once in a great while, and um, sunshine will not poop for like three months, and then it will be like absolutely mind-boggling uh, when he finally does. Um, Moonlight does like little tiny poops that look like bird poop. Um, those are mostly easy to clean, and sometimes Dewey will poop more than once a week if he's, you know, feeling like he wants to drive us crazy. But cleaning the tank is a nice opportunity for us to handle them too. So, but I would say, you know, generally once a week. And wow, there are so many comments. I just thought that there was that there were no comments. Um, a darkness lovely. A darkness lovely is the storefront in Galena that we got the spooky talk cards from, and I think you can tell from a lot of the questions that they're a little bit dated. It is so it's spooky talk conversation cards for the entire family. So I'm sure you could also get them at a bookstore or on Amazon or something like that. Um, but yeah, these are a lot of fun. I love them. Um, and let's see. Oh my gosh, there are so many questions. Okay, I'm going to read the ghost, the pumpkin poem one more time, and then I'll finish answering all of the questions. So, five little pumpkins, one more time. Five little pumpkins sitting on a gate. The first one said, oh my, it's getting late. The second one said, there are witches in the air. The third one said, I don't care. The fourth one said, let's run and run and run. The fifth one said, it's Halloween fun. Then ooh, went the wind and out went the lights and the five little pumpkins rolled out of sight. Hopefully to have their fun little adventures. So I really love that. All right. Okay, my, 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 my. Dan Yaccarino. Yes, thank you, Aftabur. Got came in clutch with the answer. That was the name that I was trying to think of. And um, hello to Johnny and um, hello to Mikey. Um, thank you all for joining. And let's see. Yeah, my next series has to be Christmas Ghost Stories. Well, you know who has a great book about Christmas Ghost Stories is Sylvia Schultz. So if you're interested in ghost stories, that have to do with Christmas and Christmas time before Halloween, you know, Christmas time was a traditional time, like before it became commercially popular. Um, Christmas time was when people would gather around the fire and tell ghost stories. So, but check out Sylvia Schultz if you're interested um, in that. And then there's a couple more questions about um, Pepper, how long it took for him to bond with us. I would say it took him several months. I would say it took him about six months to really 
get used to his surroundings. Um, he came to us in a sweater box, so he had lived in a sweater box, and some people do keep their animals in enclosures like this, and there are various arguments for and against that. Um, and in our case, he, you know, we kept him in the sweater box for a little bit so as not to shock him, but when we revamped some things in our apartment this year and upgraded everyone's terrariums, um, once we moved him into the terrarium where he had access to um, more enrichment and also uh, to see and be more um, aware of his surroundings, it increased his, or it increased his comfort levels, decreased his anxiety, and he started to become even calmer. So um, you could say that it took a year and a half for him to really fully acclimate, but as far as getting used to us, it just took him a little while. And um, no, so we never feed our snakes live. I had a ball python when I was a kid that um, I did feed live mice to. He was probably a wild-caught ball python, which I would not have known at the time. Um, but he was very cheap at a local pet store, and that was usually that's usually a bad sign. Um, wild capture is still um, a big problem with in, within the pet trade, especially with reptiles and uh, birds. Um, and but but because he was wild caught, most likely he was an extremely efficient like hunter and predator, and he never took him longer than three to five seconds to get the mouse um, constrict it. It was over very quickly, um, as humane as possible. And uh, snakes that are born in captivity don't always possess that natural instinct, so sometimes they don't even constrict like. Um, sometimes our snakes constrict sometimes and other times they don't like miles will just kind of reach up and like grab the mouse out of the tongs like very <laughs> politely and then he'll go uh, just swallow it um, so it, we would not want to put a live animal through something like that um, or risk that it would hurt one of the snakes either hello Greg um, thank you everybody for joining this evening and I think I got almost all of the questions. And um, and if not, I'll answer them in the comments after this is over. Sharon, hello, Sharon. Uh, and I don't want to miss a shout out for anybody else. So I do want to thank everybody again. We're almost at an hour here for joining me today um, and for talking all this weird talk about possession, who knew, and for meeting dear Pepper, our lovely Hog Island Boa, who is full of character and personality and is just a really interesting character. And we're so happy to have him be part of our brood. And I hope that everybody um, learns something, <laughs> even if it's nuts, not a fun fact that you'll ever use again, um, learned something or felt inspired by this. Um, and that at least we had a nice little spoopy time together. Um, I definitely encourage people to adopt, don't shop when it comes to all animals, for us to take care of the world around us and to take care of each other. And uh, hopefully have a happy Halloween and we'll see what comes next. And what's next for me personally is working on this manuscript about the old Baraboo Inn, um, judging the competition this winter. Um, for the Society of Midland Authors. I have also been working on just other projects. Jonathan and I will be launching some of our own, you know, homemade incense products and things like that this winter. And I should finally have a website or at least links where you can buy copies of my signed books without having to go through 30 steps of like emailing me and all this kind of stuff. And, and we'll see what else, um, of course, the future may bring. So again, thank you all. Hello, Dan. Um, and thank you all for joining me. And I will sign off for now. And I wish you all a very happy Halloween.